There are a lot of um, puns in this. They're all intentional. So if, if A and B are being called the same thing and you're like, why are you using the same word to talk, talk about both? That's intentional. And you're, you're supposed to tell me like, why that's wrong to do. So like, it's more of an invitation. OK, so um, right. So why am I here? Mainly, I, I want to go understand what's going on here, like what this sense-making activity that we're doing right here is. Like, what is being transferred, or how is it helping us get smarter, or whatever it is. So we've been engaging some, at something here at IPAM, this sense-making activity. And so to do it, like what we're doing is we're trying to understand our, our uh, improve our understanding of collective intelligence. And I want to collect a mathematical account of how this collective sense making works. Like, what would you say about this to, you know, understand what it is we're doing and how it's helping us? Like, what's it, what is it doing to your brain or to the way we interact or to, like, the way we connect and all that sort of stuff? And there are two reasons I want to do that. And one is it's fun. So finding the right abstractions to explain something is always exhilarating. It's like when something, when it makes sense or, like, when you kind of get it anew, um, or just discussing how intelligence is collectively generated is really fun. Um, and then simultaneously, the world is distressed in the sense that I think this new complexity of the world being wired up uh, has cha is challenging our collective sense-making capacity. So understanding what's really going on is getting more difficult. Um, so I think a constructive account of sense-making, like what it's built out of, might suggest new ways forward for that. And so uh, I think of mathematical fields as accounting systems. It makes them very, you know, uh, like plumbing. They're not exciting. They're just, just the plumbing. Um, we're just accounting. We're just accountants. So arithmetic is what an accountant would use to, uh, you know, account for, to be able to help you point to the flows of quantities, like in finance. Or Hilbert spaces are the accounting system that you would use if you wanted to say what the states of elementary particles are in quantum mechanics. You'd say, here's my account. I have this Hilbert space, and I have this transformation, stuff like that. And so it's the, uh, yeah, and probability distributions, if you want to account for why this person's winning at poker, um, it's because, you know, th this hand is more likely than that hand. So when you have an account of phenomena, what, at least a mathematical account, like, it needs to be written in a high-fidelity language. What I mean by that is it needs to be you need to be able to track the aspects of it that are important to dealing with the scenario you're in. So if you're a submarine, you need the sonar system to account properly for like what's outside the ship so that if you steer according to the submarine, the sonar, your submarine will like avoid the obstacles. So you want to track certain things. Um, and so you want to art articulate the diff relevant type differences. So like if something, if I have like shapes and numbers, those are, those are of different types. And so the accounting system should kind of say, like, that's, that's not a dollar figure. That's, you know, that's a number of widgets or whatever, and be able to account for the different types. But then I want operations, like I can multiply a number by a shape and scale it or something like that, or multiply an angle by a shape or whatever the rule of, for that would be and rotate it. So I want to be able to provide operations that correspond to the interactions I want to do with those accounted for variables. And out of all the, if math is accounting systems, what is category theory the accounting system for? Roughly, it's for interlocking structures. So mathematical definitions like a group or a topological space are a bunch of interlocking structures. And category theory tracks the layers of structure and their connections. That's what it's trying to track for you. So you can account for, you know, if you want lots of different mathematical subjects to talk to each other, then um, this helps you kind of find those analogies, uh, the similarities in structure. It makes those analogies formal objects that you can track with this accounting system. Um, I've been really inspired by uh, Mike Levin's work. So I, I almost was calling this talk something about operatic morphology. But uh, I decided to go into sense making because I'm also really interested in that. Um, so collective intelligence, this, the product of culture, is all around us. Namely, it's in, it's in our science. So what is collective intelligence. It's in our science, it's in our technology, our governance, and our morality, uh, and uh, you know, everything else. So each of these, like our morality or our governance structure, is a product of work over millennia to try to refine what it is where that thing is. And so each body, like my body, is a, collection, a collective of cells whose individual intelligence work harmoniously to create the intelligence at my level. And similarly, the government or um, 
well, technology or science, maybe even morality, like the way agents give accounts of themselves um, to it, it, like work together to form like what the new, what, how we're gonna deal with new kind of moral issues. So I want a language and logic for the shape of that. Like by shape, I'm use, trying to use a very generic word, but what, what kind of, how would you talk about this, this leveling up? So rather than understanding the lowest level, like fundamental physics particle, I want to, and rely on emergence to get us all the way up, I want to make sure that I'm looking for, for construction principles that are compositional. So I want to say no matter what we start with, how could you build up something like intelligence from there? Um, or what, what sorts of moves, what sorts of like snapping together would make it possible to get all the way up? So, right, what do I want? I want an algebra in which interacting intelligence form an intelligence. Um, and I think this category theoretic op notion of operad, which is, under no is not known enough, I think, seems appropriate. So basically an operad, and I'll talk about this in the talk, it lets you create arbitrary, like geometric or algebraic or whatever sort of syntax you want. So you design the operad. Like there are operads that have been already designed, so you can kind of like in that last talk, like here's a bunch of things that we know how to do already. Now maybe you can go and try uh, to find something else that you could do with what we've got. Well, in the same way, operads are um, combination rules that you could use that people have made already, but you can make your own operad and, uh, and start to, for in this case, try to figure out like how would you put together intelligences to form an intelligence. Um, so this operad would be a custom accounting system for how intelligence is combined. Okay, so when you look at that, that gray area says A plus B in it. And when I look at that or that, it feels like trying on a friend's glasses or something. It makes me feel bad, like something's wrong and you're gonna break my senses. Like that in the area there is not A minus B. That's A times B. And so what, the fact that you get a sense of that, or at least I get a sense like, ah, what? That's confusing, or that's confusing. Um, the fact that you get a sense of that, uh, I'm, I'm asking here, like, what separates, what gives you uh, this? So the bad math student memorizes formulas. They're trying to get an A also, but they're doing it wrong because they're trying to survive instead of trying to sense make. They are missing, they're missing the point about getting a sense of it. But the good student gets a sense. They track the ideas with the symbols. So they have this accounting. They have this kind of um, this tracking. And I would say that our senses are the entirety of our connection to anything that's happening. So you're using your senses right now. You're getting a sense of this. You have a sense of like whether I'm trustworthy. You, there is like, you know, the good tennis player is using their senses. Their, you know, their five senses but also the senses that they have for how you're supposed to like lunge or all that sort of stuff. They're sensing distance, speeds, angles. There's hundreds of trillions of atoms involved even like every second, um, but they're, they're tracking the right ones or they're tracking the right patterns. So how are they doing that? That is what I think senses do. Like when I say sense, I'm talking about your ability to track the right patterns to get to that ball uh, in a tennis match. So how do we get our senses and how is it that we sense the situation? That's the question I want to know. Uh, so with x squared plus 3 equals 7, you might have a sense of what to do before you know the answer. You might look at it like, yeah, I'm going to be able to do that. Or you might right now have a sense of which way the exit is without having to like, that's kind of like available because you, like I can instantly ask you which way the exit is and it's going to take you like less than two seconds to figure it out. So there's so much to track, right? But we are able to do it. Can we make sense? So the I'm just asking the question here. Can we make sense of this ability we have to make sense? So yeah, so here's the first pun, I guess, sense-making, the pun that wasn't. I'm using this word in two ways. First, we make sense of X, Y, Z. So sometimes we shake our head and we say, I, no, that, that doesn't make sense. I, I'm, not, I'm not tracking that. It doesn't add up. And there's just no point to accepting something if it doesn't make sense. Like, why would you say, like, okay, sure. Like, when you say it, you almost shrug and you're like, this is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense, but I guess I'm going to do it anyway. And something feels really wrong. But when they explain it in this different way, um, they say something just slightly different, like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And now once it makes sense, when it kind of clicks into, in the, into place, 
now you're able to kind of hang out with it and really move with it and like play the tennis game or, or actually do the algebra problem. So what is that clicking into place? Like what's, what's that about? But then the second way of using the word sense is that something has made our senses. Like we have evolved. And so our ability to sense the color and taste of the strawberry, um, to track the right aspect of the tennis match or math problem, something made those senses for us in the past. And so how do we play so beautifully? Um, so I'm hypothesizing here that these two meanings are the same, that this is past and present, present and past, um, that we produce the senses that we later enjoy or our progeny enjoys through sense-making work. Now, of course, they would be doing it in a way that was like different than a human feels when they're making sense. But I'm asking the question, is it possible that sense-making is the production of sense? And that what we do is we install what we know about sense when we make sense of something. Someone understands in neuroscience something called patch clamping or something. That's what my dad did. Uh, then they install that into the microscope. Like that's what, they, uh, that's what you do, right? So when you understand something, then you write a how-to like into computer code. You kind of write it into computer code. You write it into books. You take, you install the, what you, the sense you've made into something that can be passed on. So your sense of beauty and good, you install into DNA with mate selection. So it's like we take the, our sense of the world and we try to like push it into the deepest structure that we know how to push it into. Um, and so maybe that would kind of, uh, that would be a way that sense making present becomes sense, senses. So I'm asking now, what do you think of this hypothesis? Does it make sense? Um, there's a pun, but like I'm really asking, that pun is intentional, and like, could it, could it be that past sense-making activity installed into deep structures accounts for the senses today, we have today? I'm, this is not a finished account, so like I, what I'm gonna give you here is not the answer, a definitive answer, it's a hypothesis for, that I'm more, most interested in like getting in, uh, in, like feedback from you guys. So, so does that account uh, that I've given, like does it feel settled enough that, that we could go on with it at least for this talk? Um, all right, let's do it then. <laughs> Thanks. So if so, then the real, world, real work would be to understand what sense-making is. How is it produced? What are the specs of it? And so my hypothesis, again, you probably maybe sense, uh, gotten this coming, but that, that sense production has to do with proper accounting. So when we shake our head and we say that doesn't make sense, we're saying that it doesn't settle all the accounts. There's something left over. Like, no, that doesn't make sense because... Why would Bob have, have said that thing to Mary if, you know, there's something left over. So we jiggle the pieces, we try different arrangements, and then something clicks, something settles into place, it feels great, like, oh, that, oh, is like a happy sound. Um, the energy level drops, it feels like it's all accounted for, and that, that is like when it makes sense. And now we can start to work within that system and not be making lots of mistakes all the time. So I, I personally don't think this is merely Bayesian. I don't know enough about like the Friston approach or even the Bayesian brain stuff to think that, to, to really say, but it feels like there's a phase change here and um, that sense making has this kind of groping in the dark, but maybe I'll learn something. So I'm gonna offer this and then hope to receive some feedback that no, there really is something possible here. But this kind of groping in the dark followed by a click. And then once you have this click, you can start to build on it. So this kind of edifice of sense, like you're building a structure of mathematics, you can build very, very big skyscrapers from this click of sense. So I haven't seen anything really account for the delight of that or the fact that you can build such edifices once, you, um, once the click happens. Okay, so here's the like math part of the talk, which I didn't really focus on too much, but I'm gonna just take you through like this operat idea and stuff. So, Okay, well, if accounting systems are, are important and math is a counting system, I'm not saying all accounting systems are math. Otherwise, we'd have to have like our little, our little amoeba ancestors doing math. Um, but, but just that mathematical fields are accounting systems. Maybe if we want to account for the click, we could at least try to, like if we want to account for sense making, we could at least make that account within math. I know there's a level, like a le not a problem here, there are two levels which are a little bit hard to track maybe. Uh, but what I'm saying is that the account we're gonna give today of sense making would be in math, not that all sense making is made of math. Just that this today about how sense making is done. 
So I think category theory is a great language for this. Now, don't get your hopes up. I do not have an account of sense making. So this remainder of the talk is about an accounting system in which I think an account of sense making might be told within. So this would be, I don't know what the account, how, how you account for sense making. I think it might live within this accounting system that's coming up. Like, I don't know how teleportation works in quantum mechanics, but I know that you're apparently supposed to be able to do it with Hilbert spaces. Okay, so that's the sort of thing. So let me tell you briefly about the operatic approach. So um, yeah, ask for details if, it, if you're interested, and that's what I'm here to talk about. So I know we only have uh, the rest of the day, but, uh, um, and maybe less, but that, that uh, this is what I'm here to talk about. So, so let me tell you what it is. So the operat idea, an operat is an e pluribus unum system. So that's the motto of the US, out of many one, uh, that you, you, you specify what are the many, what are the one, what are the set of possible interfaces. You specify that. If you want to make an operad, you would say, here are the objects, or the, what people call the objects, or I'm calling the interfaces. And you specify how the inter interfaces are allowed to be arranged within any interface. So for example, you can make inter interfaces like shapes, which we'll see later. But really, basically, you could make interfaces to be just sets. Now, what, how is a set an interface? Well, it's just language right now. So like, just pretend a set was an interface. It's kind of like the way you're seeing the world. I see, I see colors, and I see shapes, and I see numbers. And those are three sets. And that's kind of how I interface with the world or something. It's a little bit of a weird word here. But it's more of a better word for the later slides. OK, so we have these, maybe the interfaces are sets, and the arrangements are functions. So here we're building one element, phi of s1, comma s2, comma sn, in s prime out of many elements, s1 through sn. And so this system of building one thing out of many is what operads are about. Um, so you also specify how nesting works. And this will be a lot clearer pretty soon. So the original operad was the operat of boxes positioned within boxes. And this mattered for topological um, algebraic topology issues. So here I have three boxes positioned within a box and three boxes positioned within a box. So this would be an arrangement and this would be another arrangement in the terms above. The interfaces would just be boxes. There'd just be one interface called box. So this operat has only one object or one interface called the box. But for every n, it has a whole space of arrangements um, two elements of that space of arrangements are shown. That's an arrangement, and that's an arrangement. And then you can nest that because you can put tiny boxes inside the red box or inside the green box, and you would get like tiny boxes within a big box. And that's the nesting. And you can keep going, drawing boxes as small as you want, and that's operads. So it's kind of like a fractal-y type language, like for building fractals, and you can really literally build fractals and, with operads. But I want to talk about them in terms of a more relevant operad, which is wiring diagrams. So here, the objects are going to be boxes that have input ports on the left and output ports on the right. So this big box around the side, around the outside there, is, uh, has two input ports on the left and two output ports on the right, whereas X3 has two input, put, input ports on the left and one output port on the right. So those are the interfaces, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and the big thing, and all other possible ones. So it's all the possible interfaces would be you specify a number of uh, ports on the left and right. And the arrangements are wiring diagrams, like how, who's talking to who. And so this lets you, when you nest this thing, you can build higher levels of abstraction. So for example, each, each of these xi's could be a transistor, and you put them together and you get a, a logic gate. And you put logic gates together, and you get a adder circuit. And you put adder circuits together, you get a CPU. And you put those together, you get server farms. And you can keep going as far up or down as you want. You can stop at any point. You don't have to. The operat is just the rules for building new, uh, new arrangements. So, so the ability to put within X3, like a smaller wiring diagram, that, that like you're look, you say you want to just keep zooming in with your, you have your little phone, you zoom in. You see what the problem is. You kind of zoom out a little. That's what operads let you do. So there's an even more relevant operad to sense making, I think, that's much more dynamic. Namely, the boxes in this thing can change their number of ports. So I can close my eyes. I can open up my eyes. When I'm opening my eyes, I'm seeing you. 
seeing you getting data in, and when I close my eyes, I'm no longer getting that type of data. And if I wanted to, I could leave the room, like we're gonna leave each other soon, and we'll go our separate ways. And so what basically the way this operad works is it's like a wiring diagram operad, except that the wiring diagram itself can change in time. And it changes based on what flows on the wires. So if I say, I will meet you at 3 p.m., then it may happen that at 3 p.m., like we link up and my eyes see your face and your, fa your eyes see my face or whatever. And then we say, I gotta go. And the other guy says, no, stay. And then we say, oh, da, 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 da. and then you can leave. But like, so the dynamical system, this is what I'm calling the operatic morphology. So the boxes can run around in this operad. Um, so it's difficult, one thing I like about Mike Levin's stuff is like it's difficult to distinguish between morphology and behavior. Like the, the behavior within a company, my behavior within a company can change the company's morphology. In other words, which people are talking to who, who who's responsible, who's the report, who's the boss, whatever. Um, so the morphology can change and it, you can't, it's kind of hard to distinguish whether that's behavior or morphology. So operads are designed to give algebraic theories. Basically, you don't just have these boxes. You install stuff into them. You put, put stuff inside them. So um, if you had an operad that consisted of certain interfaces and certain arrangements, then what's called an O algebra is a set of things that are allowed to fill the interfaces. Like before, we just had these boxes within boxes. But now we can say inside of each box, x1, x2, x3, I'm going to put a blah, a tensor. I'm going to put a dynamical system. I'm going to put a continuous, hybrid, discrete dynamical system, whatever you want. And all the operator is supposed to do is tell you how to put these things, how they can be put together. And the algebra says, like, when you have an arrangement of fillers, what filler do you get? So if this isn't quite, like, if you're not quite getting it, that's fine. Like, this is a big topic and not that hard. It's about as hard as you can imagine. Like, it's, it's not that bad, but it would take more than like five minutes to do. So, so if you fill every box here with a dynamical system, an open dynamical system, like an automaton or an ODE, an ordinary differential equation system, then um, when you, like what that would mean is that X1, say, is getting an input from its outside world and using those to update its state. So it's in some state, it's happy, then it receives this data, and now it moves to sad, and it says like, like Bob, and then, Whatever, so like it's saying stuff, it's saying stuff out of the output wires there, and those things are being received as inputs to the next dynamical system. So that dynamical system, x dot equals f of x or something, it's really x dot equals f of x comma input variable. And that input variable affects it, affects the, the change. So, so we specify if we want to give an algebra, so there's an algebra of these dynamical systems, and then if somebody wanted to, they could just put into this, into x1, this dynamical system, and into x2, that dynamical system, and they could see how the whole thing behaved. Um, and the arrangement tells us how we form this composite dynamical system from the pieces. It says, well, you know, this, the, this variable that's missing in x2 is coming from x1. So it's f of x, you know, f of x1 or something. And so we're going to we're gonna, we, it, the, the arrangement tells us how to put all that together to form one big ODE that the person looking at this outer box would see. They'd see this really big system of ODEs. But if we wanted to, we could tell them, well, that's because it's coming from these little parts. And then they could diagnose, oh, I think the real issue is probably an X3 or something like that. Now, all this stuff about um, dynamical systems that are in boxes that can change their input and output shape and kind of curl into a ball or like, you know, whatever, or open their eyes, close their eyes, and, and have little wiring diagrams that, wire, that change their pattern based on what flows. All of that can be formalized really cleanly using something called polynomial functors. So if you're interested in the actual math of it, um, polynomial functors are, are my favorite way of talking about it. It just makes all the math really elegant. And so, yeah, I think the math is, I claim the math is elegant, uh, and it's a container, it's a kind of accounting system for little machines that adjust their configuration. And it holds both electrical circuits, so like you can account for electrical circuits and transistors and how you build up CPUs from those. And it can account for deep learning, the, the kind of training of a deep neural network uh, fits right in there. So, um, but there's tons of room between deep, deep neural networks, even with like all the fancy, you know, um, fancy stuff that I know of at least. 
um, well, not too fancy, I guess, recurrent and like um, physics inspired neural networks and all the stuff I know about with neural networks at least is easy to account for within there. And there's just tons of room between electrical circuits and anything I've heard of in deep neural networks. There's a whole range of things where like, we're coming together, we're talking, we're leaving, and stuff like that. That's just completely absent. So it's like this empty continent where the West Coast and the East Coast have been explored, and the middle of the country is completely unexplored. Um, so I think there's a key idea missing. Like both circuits that make my phone work and deep, net, deep neural nets are amazing, but they don't seem like they're going to explain life. Um, it doesn't seem like they're going to explain really anything is the problem, deep neural networks. And so sense making is the thing we're trying to talk about. So I, I'm, I think we're missing something. And I don't know it, but I'm asking by what algorithmic strategy could you build up sense making? So if each of the little boxes, so this is a question for you. If each of the little boxes is a sense maker, then by what adjustments? Like when you're trying to construct a, a, a conference so that the little sense makers can get together and make a new sense, um, by what adjustments would we, would the collective come together to form a sense maker? How would we decide when we talk to Bob and when we talk to Sue? So my, my question, maybe my, what I'm wondering or proposing is maybe if every box could announce, well, here's the problems I know how to make sense of. Like if you, if you want to know about op rads, like come to me. And uh, if every box says like, well, I know how to draw really good pictures of cats or something like that. If every box could announce what, the, what problems they know how to make sense of, could the adjusting collective arrange those pieces? I want to know by what algorithm could you arrange those pieces so that they're doing the kind of sense making they like to do, but we can arrange them to solve higher problems. So that's the kind of account that you could tell in this story, in this accounting system that I don't have yet. So the operatic approach says we just need this kind of inductive step. We need to know how, you, how a collective of sense makers constitutes a sense maker. And so the following is hypothetical. I'm grouping for the right idea here. But what if sense making is just proper accounting? So what if what we make sense by accounting for what's happening, we somehow put it away. So if each small box says, I can account for this aspect of my in input, then when the adjusting interaction pattern gets things right, then like, like I say, well, that's because Bob spilled his breakfast this morning. And you say, oh, OK, now it all makes sense. And it clicks into place because we had the right interaction. The things I know how to account for and the things you know how to account for kind of click, and the accounts would settle. And so the claim is like, so what would that do? If, 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 senses, if our senses constitute the totality of our ability, if I'm saying that like everything I know how to do is from sense making and senses, then that would say that if accounting explains sense making, then accounting would have to explain all of our ability. So I am, again, I'm, I'm trying this out here. It doesn't feel like it's really quite done, but I'm going to try. So that proper accounting creates intra-level, like between us, and inter-level, between level, coherence. So when the government wants me to have an account of my nonprofit, they want to be able to like look into what's going on at their level and make a coherence with what the sort of stuff we do. So cohering structures align high-level decisions to low-level actions. So they get to decide whether we get to be a nonprofit or not. They get to decide what to do with us. And so it allows like a higher-level governance structure to like reach in and get all the way to something that compiles to atoms because the accounting system has somehow like made the low-level activity intelligible to the high-level activity. So this, this accounting creates this kind of a th thread of intelligibility so that like me being able to move my muscles through brain signals is actually mediated by like what I'm reading on a screen. And that kind of all the way down, that compiling all the way down is maybe, question mark, I'm asking, could that be just proper accounting? Like properly finding the right language, it, like cellular language, to um, track the variables that need to be tracked. OK, so right, so we're in the sixth grade extinction. It's nipping at our toes. I think the activity we're doing that's killing animals is not going to stop there. And, and my guess is that the civil unrest uh, is caused by people feeling the sixth grade extinction coming for them. Because people who were relevant to the system, who, who were taking their sense-making capacity and using it effectively, like someone who's a mortgage broker, 100K a year job, I think those have largely gone extinct. And so at least I know somebody who lost their job to AI. 
Um, so I think people are trying to make sense of this, and it's too hard. And so they're turning to QAnon and, and stuff like that. I mean, there's a million QAnons. QAnon is just the biggest QAnon. Um, but I think everyone naturally knows how to sense make, but we're really disoriented. And my bet, my feeling is that it's possible, it seems like sense making, kind of like vegetables or exercise, is like nutritious for everyone always. Like, is that true? I don't know. I just get this feeling that, like, is sense making, isn't it always good? Um, would, is there anyone you wouldn't want to help sense make? Like, I would help Donald Trump make sense of things if I could. <laughs> Um, so understanding sense making should be fun, useful, and safe. It's not the kind of AI building that would build paperclip maximizers. It's the kind of AI building that would make a sensible world where there was more consciousness, and in other words, experience and sense. So if we, if we understood how sense was produced and tuned, that would be great, but also how it's distinguished from the just so stories that are in constant need of shoring up that you find in QAnon. These just like, oh, because of this and this, and like, oh, well, that's happened because of this, constantly missing uh, a feeling of sense. But to keep this sense-making thing grounded and generalizable and uninfected by an agenda, um, I think that it should be as formal and elegant as possible. So to summarize, sense-making is an activity we naturally do, and I think that trying to survive isn't as effective for survival as trying to sense-make. Now, that's a weird claim, but... I think the student who tries to survive in class does not survive as well in their math class as the student who tries to sense make. So maybe all the sense we have was actually made and installed by our predecessors through something like proto sense making. Now, category theory is an accounting system for interlocking structures. Uh, operads can help us make sense of hierarchical systems. And there's an operad for dynamical systems that rearrange their connectivity. And I'm wondering whether this is enough to, as an accounting system where an account for sense-making could be written. Um, it's possible even that our sense-making itself is produced by proper accounting. So to make sense of sense-making, we have to just account for it. This operatic account that sense-making would be made by properly arranging sense-makers is missing a key idea. So it's, it's, it's like, it's where I am with it, but it's missing a key seed, this kind of inductive step. So our world needs better sense-making, but luckily it's fun, profitable, and good. Okay, thank you.